The following is a production of the University of Minnesota. Yeah. Thank you for that introduction and thank you for the opportunity to talk to you about um, some of the work that I did as part of my dissertation project. And then again, like Eric said, I'll be mentioning some of the work I'm doing here as, uh, during my postdoc. And so I figured it's a, a fitting topic to be discussing winter hardiness, seeing as the weather that we've been having. So cold is a relative thing. Um, and I thought I was pretty hardy coming from New England, moving here. And last year we had snow in May and then these temperatures. And I was really, really taken aback. But this is kind of funny because my uh, sister-in-law and brother-in-law live in Florida and he works outside. And so uh, last week when it kind of dipped down into the, the 40s, he was all bundled up with his jacket. He's like, wow, this is what ice fishing must feel like. And I'm like, no, no. <laughs> so needless to say, he's not going to be visiting us anytime soon. Um, Still so here, uh, I thought this was pretty funny. <laughs> uh, getting out our winter coats at zero, uh, Hollywood disintegrates. And here, Sam was telling me that actually a, a person that he was uh, giving a talk to said they had Girl Scouts come out onto the ice to an ice house to sell them Girl Scout cookies. So yes, pretty hardy here. And then Santa abandons the North Pole. But so again, cold is a relative thing. And, and when we talk about plants, um, we really are talking about um, the distribution of plants and the impact of temperature on that. And so um, plants growing in you know, New England and here in Minnesota, northern climatic regions, are adapted to these decreases in temperature that ha happen on a yearly basis. So temperatures reaching um, at freezing or well below freezing. And so although these plants may be adapted to these decreases in temperature, we still see that they may be susceptible to winter injury, so to the factors that occur when you see those, those low temperatures. And in general, when we talk about um, the different abiotic and biotic factors that contribute to winter injury, there are several that we can kind of outline and take a look at. So, um, so when we look at these different factors, um, we talk about actually direct low temperature kill. So this is freezing stress. Um, due to temperatures at or below freezing. Uh, crown hydration, so this is related to freezing stress where you may have hydrated tissues exposed to freezing temperatures causing ice formation in those cells. Winter desiccation, so typically you see this occurring on elevated areas or undulated areas um, causing extreme dehydration. Ice encasement, uh, you can sometimes see when um, you have warming temperatures snow melts and then you have ice reforming or like last year where we had a rain event and then temperatures dropped to below freezing and you can see that ice forming leading to anoxic conditions and potentially death of the plant and then low temperature fungi uh, things like snow mold that can just cause injury or depending upon the type of snow mold can lead to death of the plant so overall when we take a look at these different factors um, across different plant species including grasses um, uh, tolerance to freezing temperature has been identified as a major component of winter hardiness. So uh, going forward with my dissertation research, uh, I chose to focus on looking at freezing stress and the changes uh, that occur in the plant in response to this. So freezing injury due to these temperatures um, really causes injuries at cellular membranes. So these are the, the primary sites that you're seeing damage that's leading to uh, death of cells and then ultimately can lead to death of the plant. And so there's two different types of injury that can happen. So you can have mechanical damage where you're having ice formation and those ice crystals are puncturing the cell membranes and then rupturing them. Or you can have um, dehydration stress. So if you have um, an extreme amount of ice forming on the outside of those membranes, water is going to be removed from the cells and moved out, and then you're going to see loss of membrane function due to that. And so specifically, just as I had mentioned, um, intracellular ice formation, so where you have those ice crystals forming inside the cells, that's lethal. So that's going to lead to cell death because it's going to rupture the membrane. However, if you have extracellular ice formation, plants can actually tolerate that. So there are conditions where it can lead to cell death, but um, for the most part, plants have the capacity to tolerate that, that formation. And they tolerate that um, by going through the process of cold acclimation. And so um, when we talk about cold acclimation, we're really talking about the changes that start to occur as temperatures decrease as well as photo periods decrease. So, as we move from late summer and into early fall, temperatures start to decrease and this starts to trigger changes in the plant 
that leads to an overall um, better cellular stability. And so the changes that occur within the plant are allowing it to withstand severe dehydration and then ultimately um, preventing against freezing injury. So there are several metabolic changes that occur during the cold acclimation process, and these are well documented across various plant species, including grasses. And so initially, we see changes in gene expression that then lead to a trigger of different changes. And that includes the accumulation of compatible solutes. So these are things like carbohydrates or um, amino acids, as well as um, differences in protein content. So a lot of times you'll see the upregulation of uh, different types of uh, proteins. So there can be um, ice recrystallization proteins that prevent ice from forming, or you have other types of proteins like dehydrins, which are part of the late embryogenesis abundant proteins. And they, again, prevent against dehydration um, of the membrane and of other proteins. Uh, in uh, some plant species, it's been seen that there's an increase in antioxidant scavenging capacity. So one of the things that can happen as um, temperatures start to decrease is that you can have the production of radical oxygen species. And so what those species do are attack cell membranes and lead to membrane um, uh, destabilization. So what you'll see is an increase in different antioxidant species that are able to scavenge those um, radical oxygens and then um, detoxify them so that they're not causing damage within the cell. And lastly, um, one of the, the main changes we see is an alteration in membrane composition. So plants have the capacity to change not only the, the phospholipid species that are found in their membranes, but they also can change the, the amount of saturation in their fatty acid tail. So, Let's say under ambient conditions, you can have unsaturation, but as um, temperatures start to decrease, that's going to result in um, your membrane becoming rigid. So in order to prevent against that, um, plants can add double bonds into those tails, which is going to make the membrane remain fluid as temperatures start to decrease. And so all of these changes um, specifically take months. So it's initiated as those temperatures decrease, but to reach the full potential of freezing tolerance, it takes you know, well over months through, through the fall um, before winter. So in contrast to this process of cold acclimation, which results in an increase in freezing tolerance, um, we have an opposite process of cold deacclimation. And so this process typically occurs in spring. So as temperatures start to warm, plants are going to start to regrow, and what you'll see is a concomitant decrease in freezing tolerance. So this is typically when it happens. And basically what we're seeing is, in most cases, just a reverse of what happened during the process of cold acclimation. So we're seeing um, that this process is triggered by increases in temperature as well as increases in photo period, and that it occurs more rapidly. So in comparison to months for the plant to achieve its maximum freezing tolerance, we can see that plants will deacclimate, and depending upon how high the temperature is or how long the exposure is, um, within days. So it can completely deacclimate. And so this potentially will predispose plants to freezing injury if they're re-exposed to freezing temperatures. And so again, um, these increases in temperatures or mild warming events can actually cause premature cold deacclimation. So Typically, again, it occurs in the spring, but if in the winter you have an increase in temperature for a, a short period of time, this can induce some of those changes. And so what you'll see is that, um, again, you're going to have a decrease in freezing tolerance, and those plants will be um, predisposed to injury. And what we've seen in, um, in some species is that you'll have an increase in cellular water content. So plants will actually start taking in water because they're thinking they need to start growing. So they'll increase their water content, and then again, if temperatures drip, drop, drop below freezing, that water will freeze and then rupture the membrane. Um, another important change that happens is that you can have the metabolism of those solutes that were um, created during that cold acclimation period. So you can see an increase in both um, carbon and nitrogen metabolism during these mild warming events. <laughs> and so from a, um, a research perspective, we approach this um, by looking at the changes in freezing tolerance that occur during, uh, during a normal season 
And we wanted to take a look at both um, acclimation and the impact on uh, freezing tolerance and the changes that occur then, as well as the impact of deacclimation uh, on freezing tolerance of, of different grasses. <coughs> and so when we talk about cool season grasses or C3 grasses, again, they are adapted to growing in northern climatic regions, but a high degree of variability exists in um, their winter hardiness levels. And so if we were to take a look at different species rankings, we see that in some cases you have cool season grasses that can survive temperatures below minus 30. And in comparison to other species, such as annual bluegrass, which uh, is commonly found on golf courses, or perennial ryegrass. And perennial ryegrass has the lowest freezing tolerance of, of the cool season turf grasses. And so you can see injury occurs or can occur at temperatures as high as minus 5 degrees Celsius. So knowing this and knowing that we are seeing differences in species, um, we've also seen that there are differences between um, or among cultivars of these different species. And so we really wanted to exploit that in order to determine what was accounting for those differences. So our hypothesis was that um, differences in the freezing tolerance that we detect are attributed to both the ability of the plant to achieve freezing tolerance during the cold acclimation period, but also its ability to maintain freezing tolerance during, um, say, a mild warming event. So the capacity to resist deacclimation. And so we developed studies that really addressed um, looking at uh, varying in capacity uh, to undergo those changes as well as um, studies that would look at the metabolic changes that occur in response to deacclimation. And so our overall um, research goal for uh, conducting these studies was to provide insight on the mechanisms. And so once we were able to um, define or maybe negate what the mechanisms were that were occurring, we could use those to breed or screen for germplasm and then breed for improved cultivars with better winter hardiness and an overall better freezing tolerance. So with that in mind, um, we developed four research objectives. Um, the first two, looking at um, perennial ryegrass but examining the changes that occur during cold acclimation. So really focusing on that, that initial period. And then the second two objectives were looking at deacclimation um, thresholds as well as uh, deacclimation resistance. And so for today's talk, I'm going to focus on the first two re research objectives. And I'll touch a little bit about deacclimation um, when I'm talking about the metabolomics work that I'm doing now. So um, for objective one, we really were looking at specific um, mechanisms or, or physiological changes that were occurring during cold acclimation in different ryegrass accessions. And so we really cho chose to study ryegrass because it does have poor winter hardiness, but it's still widely used. So it's very uh, quick to establish, and it has excellent wear tolerance. And a lot of times you'll see ryegrass seed in home lawn mixes like that you can buy at Home Depot. And it's also used a lot on sports fields. Uh, and so, specifically, it's been um, identified that uh, direct low temperature kill is one of the major factors contributing to winter injury of perennial ryegrass. And so my advisor at um, the University of Massachusetts, Michelle DaCosta, went to graduate school with Eric. And so um, the, we really set up a collaboration to use plant material that had been identified by um, Brent Holke. So, he was a graduate student here that worked a lot with ryegrass and screening different um, accessions and establishing their freezing tolerance levels. And so we obtained plant material um, from Brent and Eric. And uh, Brent, through evaluation in both the field over several years, as well as conducting um, controlled freezing tests, he, uh, he established ryegrass accessions that had better freezing tolerance compared to the commercially available cultivars um, that were on the market at that time. So we really wanted to um, identify what those differences were contributing to those differences. And so this picture is from Brent, and you can see that this is following a, a winter that you do have differential survival where these bare areas, um, there was grass, but did not survive. And so again, <laughs> this led us to ask if um, differences in cold acclimation capacity uh, contribute to the differences in freezing tolerance and winter hardiness that we're seeing um, in the field 
in in controlled environment studies. And so the objective of this study was to evaluate those changes in crowns, so the survival organ of the plant, of perennial ryegrass. And so there have been other studies conducted using ryegrass, but a lot of those looked at leaf level changes. So we were concerned about and really uh, interested in what changes were happening in the crown that were allowing it to survive. So we chose um, two tolerant uh, perennial ryegrass accessions and two susceptible accessions. And again, this was based on um, evaluations that Brent had done previously. Um, we acclimated these plants in a growth chamber at a constant level of two degrees Celsius. And then in order to look at the rate of cold acclimation capacity, we chose several times to harvest. So we took a baseline harvest at zero days of acclimation, and then we harvested every week. So at seven days, 14 days, and 21 days. And we were really hoping that this would allow us to, um, A, look at the overall acclimation capacity of these, so at 21 days, but again, look at the changes that are happening over that time period. We, um, we harvested crown material, so this involved us um, destructively harvesting the plant, and then we got down, um, trimmed the shoot and the root, and we harvested the, the crown material here for analysis. <coughs> and using that crown material, we looked at um, carbohydrates, so different carbohydrate fractions, proline, so proline is an amino acid that's been shown to um, potentially have an antioxidant effect during cold temperatures, but also uh, its uh, function to stabilize membranes under low temperatures, and also changes in lipid composition. So looking at the ability of the plant to change or alter its composition in double bonds in response to these decreases in temperature. And specifically what we were looking at were changes in the, the phospholipid groups. And so we were focusing on um, PC, PE, and PA. And so when uh, we look at phospholipid species, under um, ambient conditions, typically what you'll see is higher levels of PE and PA. However, um, as temperatures start to decrease and um, the membranes start to rigidify, these can actually cause destabilization of the membrane. And so an increase in PC actually helps to stabilize the membrane and prevent it from any sort of mechanical disruption. So we were really interested to see if we could have an increase uh, in this or a decrease in these levels. Okay, so moving on to the results from the study. Um, first, we're, we're taking a look at the total water-soluble carbohydrate content. And so again, this is in the crowns of those perennial ryegrass plants. So, um, on the x-axis, you have uh, days of acclimation, again, that, that weekly harvest date that we selected. And um, through here, you have your susceptible accessions followed by your tolerant, and, and these are the LSD bars. So the important thing, or there's a couple of things to, to note here, that even under um, non-acclimated conditions, you see that that tolerant one accession had inherently higher levels of total water-soluble carbohydrates. And then as we expose them to two degrees Celsius for, um, for these different acclimation days, you see that following seven days, it still had higher levels compared to the other accessions. And then by 14 days, you see that the tolerant two was able to accumulate carbohydrates uh, to the level of, of the other accession. And then finally by 21 days, so following that two week acclimation, sorry, three week acclimation period, you see that again, um, tolerant one has significantly greater levels compared to um, the other uh, susceptible accessions. So again, these, these carbohydrates potentially could be functioning in stabilizing the membrane. So as you lose water from the cell, they can act to come in and prevent um, protein denaturation and, and membrane breakdown. And so this is a really important, um, important factor that could be contributing to the difference in freezing tolerance that we're seeing. We also looked at um, individual fractions of sugar, so one of them being sucrose. And we saw that uh, compared to the other sugars, such as uh, glucose and fructose, so we also looked at raffinose, uh, sucrose actually contributed the most to this total water-soluble uh, content. And in some cases, you see the trend is similar um, comparing the tolerant one levels uh, it, with higher levels through 14 days. but. By 21 days, those accessions had pretty much the same, the same level of carbohydrates. Again, we also looked at changes in phospholipid species, and we saw that cold acclimation did reduce or increase 
uh, PC. So again, that's that membrane stabilizing phospholipid and a decrease in PA and PE. And specifically, we saw this in the tolerant two accession. So if you were to look comparing uh, susceptible one and two, you do see that tolerant two has higher levels at 21 days. And also looking at the ratio of PC to PA and PE, it does have higher levels as well. Uh, so this indicates that this, this particular accession has the capacity to adjust those species uh, to a better degree compared to the other accessions. And we also saw the same trend with, um, with the double bond index. So the ability to maintain that membrane fluidity by increasing its, the number of double bonds that it had. And specifically, we saw that overall for PC and PE, this tolerant two had a higher level of, of double bonds compared to the other, the other accessions. So overall, um, we did confirm that Differences, or we did see that differences in the capacity to undergo some of those physiological changes um, may, be, uh, may be contributing to differences in freezing tolerance. And specifically, we saw that um, tolerant one accumulated higher carbohydrates, and tolerant two had, uh, had a greater capacity to uh, uh, adjust those membrane lipids. And so overall, what this means is those changes may help to um, result in uh, cellular stabilization, as well as um, resulting in better freezing tolerance. So they may be something that we could use to select for or increase when we're, we're looking at improving winter hardiness and freezing tolerance overall. Uh, so going forward, we, we still were working with perennial ryegrass. And we really wanted to look at the potential for um, manipulating freezing tolerance. Um, from a, um, a physiology standpoint, but also potentially using this as a management tool. So something that uh, turf grass managers could maybe implement to help improve freezing tolerance prior to the onset of winter. And so really the, the main concept behind this is the fact that uh, plants respond similarly to multiple stresses. So when we look at stresses such as um, heat or drought stress or salt stress, you see that these stresses similarly induce um, osmotic stress as well as oxidative stress. So we see that um, there's potential for dehydration with these stresses as well as the production of those radical oxygen species that can, that can uh, harm the membrane. And so when you have the response that's similar, you have similar tolerance mechanisms. And so when we look at um, exposing plants to different stresses, uh, this concept is known as cross-adaptation. So having similar tolerance mechanisms by utilizing different stresses. And so specifically what we were interested in is looking at the potential differences um, in mechanisms that plants were used and whether or not they were similar between drought and freezing. And so specifically looking at the accumulation of compatible solutes to minimize osmotic stress, um, the increase in antioxidant enzyme activity to, um, to uh, get rid of those radical oxygen species, as well as potential proteins that may be influential in um, helping prevent against uh, protein denaturation. Okay. <coughs> so it has been shown in other uh, grasses as well as other plant species that um, drought stress does increase freezing tolerance, but these studies really didn't look at what the mechanism behind that was. So what the, the physiological changes going uh, to contribute to that were. And so that's what led us to our research question was, um, what are the mechanisms that may be similar between these two stresses? And so our first objective was to determine whether we could induce an increase in freezing tolerance by using drought preconditioning. And then our second objective was to determine, well, if we do see an increase, what, what's responsible for that? So what are the me mechanisms contributing to that? So again, we were working with perennial ryegrass. This time we were choosing two um, commercially available cultivars, so Buccaneer and Sunkiss. And for our uh, treatments, which were initiated in the growth chamber, we were using these tree pots that had um, TDR probes in there. So we were monitoring soil moisture uh, via those probes. And so in order to induce um, drought preconditioning, we, um, we implemented two different, um, two different treatments. So we had a well-watered treatment, and we also had a drought preconditioning treatment. 
And then we exposed plants to 20 degrees Celsius, so a non-acclimating temperature. But we also wanted to look at the synergistic effect between drought preconditioning and cold acclimation to see if we could result in any sort of other enhancement of freezing tolerance. So again, we were using um, wilt-based irrigation. And uh, we were irrigating based on uh, visual assessment, so leaf fold and roll. We were also using the, the soil moisture measurements as an indication of when we should be rewatering. And we also took electrolyte leakage measurements, and just to ensure that we weren't inducing any um, subsequent damage due to that wilt based irrigation. So <laughs> at 20 degrees Celsius, we had five wilt events. So we, we subjected the plants to subsequent wilt events for five times. And then at, at the lower temperature of two degrees Celsius, we only went through two wilt events. There wasn't as much demand for a water use at that temperature. So following the five wilt events, we harvested uh, plant material. And then following the two wilt events, we harvested plant material. Uh, and we were using whole plants for the determination of freezing tolerance. And again, we were using crowns for analysis of um, these different components. So looking at proline, and then again, non-structural carbohydrates as part of the way to um, minimize osmotic stress. And then looking at uh, any changes in antioxidant enzyme activity as part of the way to um, minimize damage to the membrane. OK. so. What we saw was that uh, there was no interaction between any of these treatments, uh, the treatments or the cultivars or the temperature. So presenting here based on these main effects. But what you can see is that um, we did see a difference in freezing tolerance between these two cultivars. And more specifically, we saw that drought preconditioning did result in an increase in freezing tolerance. And so that was really important for us going forward with looking at the other measurements. And we also saw that cold acclimation increased freezing tolerance, which we anticipated that. And so when we saw this increase, we were really curious as to what was contributing to that, so which component. And what we saw was um, when looking at crown solute content, we saw that both proline and those total non-structural carbohydrates increased in response to drought preconditioning. So there is potential for using that wilt-based irrigation to improve or increase these um, protective components. And we also saw that a similar response where 2 degrees Celsius increased these components as well, which has also been seen before. Uh, as for antioxidant enzymes, we looked at um, ascorbate peroxidase, catalase, and glucal peroxidase. And so again, these, these have the potential to um, to scavenge those radical oxygen species and get rid of them before they attack the membranes. And so we did see an increase um, for these three antioxidant enzyme species in response to drought preconditioning with a similar response uh, detected following two degrees Celsius. And so overall, we did have the potential for manipulating freezing tolerance using a cultural practice which can be implemented in the field. And so um, Specifically, we saw that we were able to increase these different components. And this is important because it can be used as a tool uh, or something to, that um, plant managers are able to utilize. And so uh, this was, <clears throat> looking at this, this was really important for us to, to get that message out um, via you know, extension seminars and that sort of thing. So um, from both of these studies, what we saw was uh, that overall, both carbon and nitrogen metabolism differed within the accessions or cultivars that we looked at. And it was associated with differences in their capacity to cold acclimate. And so from that, uh, looking at the different uh, uh, carbohydrate fractions as well as um, nitrogenous compounds, we could use those traits potentially to select for plants that had improved freezing tolerance. Uh, or go forward with breeding for improvement in these, these components. And so this is, um, this is sort of where my research here for my postdoc comes into play with um, basing this off of differences in those metabolites. And so what I'm working on here is um, using metabolomics to, uh, to select germplasm or screen germplasm with improved overall winter hardiness. OK. And so as you've seen, it's winter injury is a major problem for this species. But another problem with printing ryegrass is that um, 
in Roseau, Minnesota, in northern Minnesota, uh, a lot of perennial ryegrass seed is produced, but the growers are having an issue with getting second year seed production. So instead of acting like a perennial, it's acting like an annual where they're having to replant it on a, every year. And so Garrett, raise your hand, Garrett. Okay, so Garrett is actually uh, is working on this second year seed production issue. But just to give you a brief overview, if you were to look at um, the, the management practices or, or how seed is being produced in Minnesota compared to Oregon, where a lot of the seed is being produced, you see that for the most part, they're on a similar sort of program, but the major difference is that in Oregon, they're able to um, harvest the same plants for seeds over, say, three to five years. And so when we take a look at what the major difference is between Oregon and Roseau, Minnesota, it's not surprising that there's a huge difference in temperature. So this could be potentially one of the issues that is contributing to that lack of second year seed production. And as well, we're seeing even here at the university that we're still having, even with Arctic Green. So Arctic Green is a perennial ryegrass cultivar that was released from here in 2007. And as of now, it has the, the best winter hardiness of any other cultivar available. However, even with that being said, we're still seeing um, uh, winter injury and lack of survival. So our hypothesis is that overall poor winter hardiness and the lack of second year seed production is attributed to low freezing tolerance. So um, what can we do about this? Well, you know, research efforts here with, um, with Eric as well as Nancy have been towards breeding perennial ryegrass cultivars with improved winter hardiness. Um, but the major, um, the major issue with this is that screening those plants is very time consuming. And so, as many of you know, like screening for any sort of um, trait, you do that in the field for several years. And that's dependent upon, you know, weather conditions where last year we had, you know, warmer temperatures and this year we've had significant snow cover for November. So it takes, it takes a lot of, uh, several years for that and is weather dependent. And then the other, um, the other method of screening is in a controlled environment. And so this is, this is time consuming as well, and it takes a lot of, of plant material. And so recently, metabolomics has been identified as a uh, potential breeding tool used for screening, and has been used to screen for uh, tolerance to different abiotic and biotic stresses. And so specifically, what um, the nice thing about uh, metabolomics is that it allows you to screen for um, multiple metabolites simultaneously. So instead of harvesting crown material and uh, allocating some towards looking at proline or some towards carbohydrates, you're able to do this in all one measurement. So it's a very high throughput way of, of looking at all of these metabolites. And specifically, uh, in my project, I'll be looking at differences in secondary metabolites. And so what we'll be doing is looking for um, differences in either the type of species, but more than likely what we'll be seeing is differences in abundance of these different types of uh, secondary metabolites. And then from there, once we identify what those metabolites are, there's potential to use those for markers in a, in a breeding program and screen for, for germplasm. So that, that basically is our long-term goal. So we'd like to develop this method and not only use it for screening germplasm for improved freezing tolerance, but Eric Kurtz has also uh, used it for screening for rust tolerance in perennial ryegrass. And so going forward, we'd like to be able to use this to identify specifically to my project and Garrett's project, uh, plants that have better winter hardiness and have the capacity to continue produce seed over multiple years. So with this as my long-term goal, <laughs> I've developed several objectives to meet that goal, um, the first of which was is to develop metabolic profiles of these ryegrass accessions, and then identify differences um, among those profiles, and really looking for metabolites that are specific to the freezing tolerant accessions, or looking for differences in abundance of those metabolites. And then confirm the presence of the relationship between those metabolites in different ryegrass accessions um, that we have in our collection here. And then going forward, um, the ideal situation would be having plants in the field that following, say, a, a, an acclimation period, a couple months in the field, we would be able to go out, 
harvest the leaf tissue, extract that, and then run it, um, run it through the LCMS and determine or select based off of that information. And so as of right now, I'm at the point where I'm um, starting to develop those metabolic profiles. And so I'll be talking a little bit about this. Um, <coughs> again, I'm using those sessions that I originally used for my first project uh, that I conducted as part of my dissertation. Uh, they consist of two uh, freezing tolerant and two freezing susceptible accessions. And then I acclimated the plants at different conditions in the growth chamber. So we exposed them to 20 degrees Celsius for two weeks, followed by exposure to two degrees Celsius for two weeks, and then sub-zero acclimation at minus two. So this sub-zero acclimation, um, in, in some of the other work that I've done, it's been shown to increase freezing tolerance. So this is done in the dark. Uh, and there's still changes that are occurring in the plant that result in an enhancement of freezing tolerance. So maybe not from a screening perspective, because this is pretty difficult to do because the plants potentially could be under snow at this point in time, and, or you would have to be doing it in a, in a growth chamber. But just as, a, as an interest to see what changes are happening in the dark compared to acclimating at two degrees Celsius for two weeks. So I harvested whole plants um, for freezing tolerance determination, and then I harvested leaf material for um, metabolic profiling or metabolic analysis. I also harvested crown material. I I'm, haven't used that yet, but um, going forward, that may be another interesting, maybe not to use it as a screening um, potential, but just to see what's going on in the crowns versus the leaf material. And I'll be working in Adrian's lab, or I have been working in Adrian's lab. Um, and Dana has been very helpful to get me started in, in conducting this analysis and getting my, um, getting my data. So I do have some preliminary results related to um, the freezing tolerance. So I did conduct a screen on these. I wanted to, before we went through the whole method of acclimating and running the samples, uh, make sure that we were seeing differences in freezing tolerance between these accessions. And so um, you will see that uh, here we have tolerant one, tolerant two compared to susceptible one and susceptible two. You do see that um, even under non-acclimating conditions, uh, and so, sorry, I should explain this. So when we're looking at freezing tolerance levels, a, a more negative number is better. So um, down here at minus 20, this is the best freezing tolerance. And so when we look across the board, you'll see that under non-acclimating conditions, you do still see that the tolerant accessions have better freezing tolerance. And subsequently, as you expose them to those low temperatures, their freezing tolerance levels increase. So going, I, with this confirmation, I went ahead and then um, put plants in the growth chamber. I harvested them. And then I conducted some um, preliminary trials just to make sure that my extraction was working and that sort of thing. And so. This is an example of a profile um, that I, I got, so some of the data that I'm looking at now. And then I'll be getting more of this data as I move through um, the analysis. And so I just wanted to sort of point out here that we are seeing differences here in the profiles between the tolerant and the susceptible accession. So you are seeing differences at the beginning of this run here, which is promising. And you'll notice that, um, so for example, I don't have it highlighted, but there are differences in abundance. So we do see that this, um, this right here is higher in the susceptible compared to the tolerant. And there's other differences in here that could potentially be uh, picked out using software. But you do see that this uh, right here at this retention time, 2 minutes, 2.06 minutes, you see that that is unique to the tolerant accession. So this would be something that we potentially would look at and then use software to identify. And then um, in, conf in confirming that in other accessions, it may be used as a, uh, as a screening uh, trait. So again, um, I'm, I'm still here. I actually ran some trial samples today. Um, and hopefully next week, I'll, I'll have my first big run and, and then be able to continue on from that. Um, and then over the next few months, I will be hopefully moving on to the, the objectives. And um, by the end of the year, uh, maybe being able to harvest some tissue from the field and, and run that um, through the LCMS. So once we have that method established, we can then go on and use it for um, the evaluation of other traits. So the, the capacity to, um, 
to look at uh, deacclimation resistance. And so <laughs> the University of Massachusetts has been doing some research with ryegrass in deacclimation. So again, um, the ability to resist those changes in freezing tolerance in response to warming events. And so you'll see here, this was um, ryegrass plants that were um, subjected to eight degrees Celsius for three days to induce deacclimation. And it's the same thing where you're seeing a lower negative number is an indicative of better freezing toler tolerance. And so you do see that there are some differences here being detected between freezing tolerant and freezing sensitive accessions. And they're still doing some work with these accessions and potentially will be, um, will be getting the plant material when they're done and will be able to, to analyze those, those results. And so um, this would uh, potentially uh, help us identify uh, plants that have um, better deacclimation resistance and don't, or uh, metabolism of those protective compounds aren't induced um, during those mild warming events. And so ultimately, we'd be able to screen for both plants with enhanced cold acclimation capacity, as well as improved deacclimation resistance. And then overall, in the long run, the, the ultimate goal would be to have plants that have better overall freezing tolerance and, and better uh, winter hardiness. So with that, I'd like to um, thank my advisor from the University of Min uh, Massachusetts, Michelle, and uh, as well as Eric, A Adrian, and Dana for helping me here and allowing me to come here and, and conduct some research and, and the funding source for the research that I've been conducting. So with that, are you willing to take any questions? Okay, so the question was, how do I plan to sort out metabolites that are related to freezing tolerance versus metabolites that are just the okay that are related to freezing tolerance? Um, that that is a good question. I haven't, I really haven't thought about that and what steps to take from there. And so that would be something that um, going forward I would have to determine how, what methods would have to be taken in order to, to establish that relationship between, between them. So yeah, that is a good question. Thank you. Are the um, tolerant lines and susceptible lines related to one another? So no, uh, the material that I'm using, that I use in the initial study and now, um, they have um, diverse backgrounds. So the, I, I can't remember exactly, but the tolerant, one of the tolerant accessions was from Romania, and then another one was uh, collected from Iran. And so, and I'm not sure where the susceptible ones are. So yeah, they are, they are diverse. 